Content warning. Ableism and discussion of eugenics. Is there really no place for us in the, 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 in the, 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 the world? No, there isn't. But we can make one. I can tell you that every time you raise issues of set but equal, the outrage of disabled individuals across this country is going to continue. It is going to be ignited. I'm going to make it a burden to not have us there. I'm going to make it a living nightmare for you. There'll be a hundred wheelchairs rolling in amazing formation. We're one of the largest minorities in, in this country. We want the right to live in the community, to be free, to not be killed, to not be mutilated, to not be tortured. There is no right or wrong body of a conscious revolutionary mind. Ableism is the bane of my motherfucking existence. Hello! If you haven't been here before, welcome to my channel. This is the place where we say the quiet part out loud. Unlike this episode of Explained, which left a lot of things unsaid. I'll be doing quick overviews so you don't have to watch it. But I actually do recommend it if you want to learn about gene editing technologies. There's a lot of cool research they talk about, like, I learned we're working on making eggs from skin cells, and I appreciate the broad range of sci-fi, utopian, dystopian fantasies that may inspire. Overall, I like the show, and this video is really more of an addition than a critique for the most part. I want to be clear from the beginning that I'm not anti-science by any stretch of the imagination. The critiques I have are not of gene editing research, which I think is really cool and generally good, but some of its potential applications and the way we talk about it, which are not. Liberalism is killing us. So let's jump into it. They interviewed a grand total of one disabled person, Rebecca Coakley. I don't suffer. I suffer from how society treats me. What she said is true and powerful. However, the show doesn't contextualize it very well. What she's expressing here is the social theory of disability, which is useful, but it has its limitations when divorced from labor relations. You can watch my first video and or read Capitalism and Disability by Marta Russell, for a more detailed explanation of this, but I'll do quick reviews so you don't have to. You should, though. One of the things the show neglected to say that's really important to understanding the pressures to use this technology to eradicate all disabilities is that disabled people have a lower labor value, that is, less time and energy we can dedicate to work due to the limitations of our bodies. We are less exploitable as workers, and capitalism will always be a death sentence for us. Many forms of socialism, too, devalue people in a similar way. Any system whereby your access to political power and care, and therefore your value as a human being, is determined by either capital or your ability to do marketable labor, and not your community's respect for life, can't value disabled people the same as abled ones. No more of this differently abled bullshit. To be fair, our lower market value is also often due to unfair discrimination, like in Coakley's case of dwarfism. There are plenty of disabilities which aren't regularly debilitating and don't have many, if any, support needs that need to be considered by employers. But employers might still treat you poorly due to personal bias or ignorance. In these cases, disability can be likened to race or gender or other marginalized identities where competence and ability to do labor are wrongfully assumed based on identity. The interpersonal, it's not me, it's you brand of discrimination, if you will, as opposed to the medical model, the way we're generally conditioned to see disability as an individual challenge to be cured or overcome, you know, it's not you, it's me. In the cases of disabilities which require relatively minor support, the prevailing liberal social theory of disability is fine. It's a sort of progress, it's better than nothing, However, it does still reinforce the idea of disability as an individual challenge, but the twist is the impetus is on ableists to be better, rather than on the disabled person to conform. This interpersonal focus takes away a lot of potential revolutionary power in disability movements. We've already seen how individual choices about prenatal testing can shift whole populations. There are now only 918 girls for every 1,000 boys in the country. I don't think individual choice means what you want it to mean. The show acknowledges that individual people will 
systematically choose traits which are beneficial in their society, in this case maleness because of the way patriarchal property laws work. But it doesn't go into the economic and social reasons why these so-called individual choices are made, and it doesn't really critique the idea of adaptation to our current environment at the expense of diversity. More on that later. At one point, they attempt a quick sort of materialist critique, but it's mostly to say that the gap between rich super babies and poor unhealthy babies will likely be widened if slash when this technology is viable and available. Cool, yeah, no, we should make eugenics available to everyone equally. I agree. Rise up, proletariat, and seize the means of selective reproduction. It's important to change people's attitudes towards disabled people, but if there's no material support, then this change can only be superficial at best. Just think about how pretty much anyone you ask in America will claim to support disabled people and think it's important to take care of us. There's a cultural taboo against saying otherwise. But I have spent most of the pandemic in Florida, a place full of elderly disabled people. And it seems the same people who claim to care were a hundred percent ready to kill us all for the sake of the economy. Well, that's not fair. They were ready to kill us so that they could go to work and provide for themselves, not understanding that there could and should exist other options. Everyone should care about disability. It's the one marginalized identity group that anyone could join at any time. And you will, probably, in old age. But people don't like to think about that. Disability advocates have often suggested using people's death anxieties against them in order to gain rights, but I feel like this pandemic has proven able-bodied people really seem to think they're invincible, and really seem to believe they have to work 40 hours a week for the world to function. And of course, they're more than encouraged to think that by employers who ask them to regularly perform superhuman feats of endurance or else risk losing their paycheck and their access to food, shelter, and security. Anyway, I want to move from it's not me, it's you, to it's not me, it's our coercive socioeconomic and political institutions, and in particular manufactured scarcity. That's not quite so catchy, though. We need to stop focusing on these cases of low-support, non-debilitating disabilities. This is not my case, nor is it the case for millions of others. When we play into this differently-abled narrative, it's dishonest and not inclusive at all. It's saying, in essence, I'm not like the other disabled. I can still do marketable labor just like any other normal person. At best, this will widen the circle of acceptability so able people are good with, say, the deaf community, but still discriminate against people with higher support needs. It's still defining our value by what we can produce rather than who we are. We need to stop communicating this to abled people and internalizing this within ourselves. We need to stop deluding ourselves into thinking that, in all cases, or even the majority of cases, disabled people can compete equally in the labor market, that our labor has a higher or different quality if not a high enough quantity, that it makes any sort of sense for an employer to hire someone who will need accommodations and days off rather than someone who won't, that we live in a culture where there are no coercive financial and social pressures to abort disabled babies. And this show doesn't talk about any of that. Choosing to abort a baby with Down syndrome, for instance, isn't the same as choosing a fetus with blue eyes rather than brown, as this episode kind of seems to imply, or at least doesn't really challenge. Disability is not simply an aesthetic choice. I'm afraid that the average able-bodied viewer might leave the show thinking that's how disabled people see ourselves. Is deafness a disease? Many in the deaf community would say it is not. See, the problem is, stuff like this is too advanced for the average abled person. I know this because I was once an abled person, or at least I saw myself that way. I took all the way up to ASL3 and learned all about deaf culture and still thought things like, well, obviously deaf people are just as capable as anyone else, they just need interpreters. But what about really disabled people? I didn't know how to say people with higher support needs. When abled people hear disability advocates talk about how it's society which is disabling without proper context, they kind of just nod along like I did and think, 
Well, okay, X thing can be an exception to the rule. I'm sure unique individuals who have these different abilities can pull themselves up by their special needs bootstraps just as well as anyone. It's patronizing to call us valuable when your notions of value are ultimately based on labor. I'd rather you just call me a slur, honestly. A person's eye color won't affect whether or not they'll earn enough money in their lifetime to properly care for themselves or their parents in old age. A person's eye color won't affect what sort of education they'll have access to. A person's eye color won't affect whether or not they can use public transit or get into buildings. You can argue that child rearing should be a selfless act, but it's not. It can't be. Not when we're denied access to housing or food or health care unless we're able to work. And even then, it's not guaranteed. And I don't really care about any spiritual arguments for having disabled babies because ultimately people are largely coerced into decisions based on their material interests. Like, it's fine. You can say God wants you to have these babies, but it's not exactly a convincing argument to just be like, Isn't that immoral? Raising a child with expensive and time-consuming disabilities in a world where your access to necessities is based on capital or marketable labor can only be seen as a luxury or a sacrifice. And this show doesn't talk about that at all. We need to talk about eugenics. So what the fuck, Leslie, you might be saying. Everything you said just then felt really mean to disabled people. I promise you, it was not. We're well aware of our limitations, and we're tired of having them ignored. But I am about to get mean now. And demonetized. <laughs> we need to talk about eugenics, and how this show doesn't present any decent arguments against it, other than, hey, the Nazis did it, and that was very bad. The reasons why it was bad are kind of just left to the viewer to already know, which I don't trust that most people do because we don't talk about it beyond Nazis equals bad. Here's what the show had to say. If you look at a pattern across countries, one of the primary variables that would explain differences is proximity to the Nazi experience. What you find is much more skepticism of the idea that somehow we're going to improve the human species. Messages like this can be interpreted as Nazis were mean and racist and didn't do eugenics right. And now we're all scared of it, even if we had the science to do it right this time. And we all know racism ended on June the 5th, year of our Lord, 2020, when the mayor of Washington, D.C. painted Black Lives Matter on the ground. Basically, it doesn't do anything to challenge the idea that we can do a quieter and more dignified eugenics this time where we can select in a much more scientific way. Not based on race, of course, but on genetics, which is a perfect science. <sighs> eugenics isn't wrong because it's mean, or we don't have enough information to do it right. Though, those things are also true. It's because the entire concept is flawed. Evolution, whether human-selected or otherwise, is the process by which an organism adapts to its environment. Let me ask you, viewer, do you think we should be narrowing our gene pool to select for success in our current socioeconomic political environment? Or, hell, our current actual environment? We already know there's going to be significant climate change in my lifetime. Isn't it short-sighted to reduce the gene pool to only that which we can foresee being valuable? Eugenics is based upon the nonsense idea that we should reduce our genetic variation and adaptability which makes us all incredibly vulnerable to unknown unknowns. Literally the only way humans have survived this far is due to our adaptability as a species. I already talked about this a fair bit in my video on selective abortion, but these things need to be restated from time to time. And the show briefly makes this point. Genetic technologies can narrow the range of human variation. And even briefly shows a study on screen which indicates that a higher risk for schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, things widely regarded as bad, is correlated with more creativity, a thing regarded as good. However, when they showed the study, it was in the context of talking about the technical issues of tweaking polygenetic traits. Which, of course, there are many issues with that and we really don't have the science. Yet. But that's not to say we never will. Very basically, there are many traits generally seen as bad, which are actually good to keep in our genetic makeup in varying amounts. Like how we all need trace amounts of zinc in our diets, though this is dangerous in high quantities. The show doesn't even go on to discuss the issues with altering epigenetic factors, like hormone exposure in utero, and other things which affect the expression of your genes, though are not part of your genetic makeup. But, of course, that's understandable. They only had 20 minutes. I'm not mad about it. 
They covered a lot of science with the time they had. I'm trying not to be too harsh on little details like that, which aren't so important, and instead focus on what they didn't say and the issues I saw with their framing. Why are we so obsessed with IQ? But one small detail, which I'm going to focus on for what will feel like way too long, is when Hank Greeley, author of upcoming book CRISPR People, says, But I do think we'll be able to say 60% chance of being in the top half, 13% chance of being in the top 10%. He's referring specifically to the SAT, but could be referring to IQ tests in general, since both of these are how we measure academic success. It's set in a section where they're discussing polygenetic traits like intelligence, so I think it's safe to assume that's the broad concept he's referring to. I trust most of you have seen Sean's video on the bell curve, or you're at least aware of it, so I don't think I need to go into too much detail on how exactly the measurement of IQ is kind of not great in general and based on race science, but I would like to contextualize the whole concept of intelligence a little bit further. The way I see it, the statement, people with high IQ are more intelligent, is true in the same way that the statement, capitalism lifts people out of poverty, is true. These tests create the concept of intelligence in the same way capitalism creates the concept of poverty. That might be a bit confusing, so let me just break that down. Imagine you're part of a semi-nomadic culture. No one in your community is unhoused, the concept of beggar doesn't even exist, everyone has access to food and water. If you think this is entirely hypothetical and these communities didn't exist, then I have some news for you about how Native Americans responded to Europeans. I've spent six years thinking about the state of European society, and I still can't think of a single one of your ways that isn't inhumane. So your community arrives at your usual summer land, only to find that it's now a glue factory. All of your previous structures are taken down, all of your usual gathering lands are fenced in, and the water is black with pollutants. When your community attempts to protest this, you're faced with state-backed violence enforcing the capitalist interests over your own. Remember that exploitation under capitalism, or feudalism, or any other exploitative system, cannot exist without some sort of agency, that is, a state or private militia, to enforce it. You know the story from here. If the government's feeling magnanimous, they may offer your community some land in a desert somewhere. Land that no one else wants because it can't be used for submit- Submission. (laughs) Uh, Okay. (laughs) Let's cut out all the Freudian slips, please. Land that no one else wants because it can't be used for subsistence. According to our current definitions and measures of poverty, you were impoverished exactly the same amount and in exactly the same way both before and after the glue factory was erected. How do you escape poverty? Well, you get a job at the glue factory, making $1.90 per day. Seriously. A wage of $1.90 per day is considered alleviation of poverty. And what choice do you have now that you can no longer access resources without capital? Congratulations, you've statistically been lifted out of poverty. Okay, maybe that was too much of a tangent. It's been a while since I've made a video, okay? I'm just trying to use a more concrete and measurable thing than intelligence to explain how these things are culturally defined. Can you see how this connects to IQ? We define it to mean these specific culturally important things, like how we define poverty by how much money one makes, and colloquially generalize it to mean something that it doesn't. When you hear, this nation has been lifted out of poverty, your first reaction might be to think of those kids in the Save the Children ads and think, Oh, that's very good. Poverty's bad. Those people must be much happier now that they can eat and drink clean water and be housed. But we didn't say they had access to resources. That's something that's falsely assumed. And when you hear, she has a very high IQ, your first reaction might be to think of geniuses inventing incredible things and think, Oh, that's very good. Low IQ is bad. She'll go on to do great things, think new thoughts, and give back to her community. But we didn't say any of those things. IQ doesn't measure ability to do good. IQ doesn't measure critical thinking skills. IQ doesn't measure anything outside of the ability to solve logic puzzles and learn new information. Useful skills, for sure not the only useful skills. This high IQ individual could go on to develop more effective drone strike technology, or a new taxonomy of race, or an AI that figures out the meanest thing you can say to a person and then says it. Certainly, people like Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris and Ben Shapiro score above average on IQ tests and are, in fact, knowledgeable and proficient in their respective fields of Jungian psychology, 
neuroscience, and debating college students about whether feminism has gone too far when women have blue hair. But just because these people have this specific knowledge doesn't mean they know anything else at all. Going to Jordan Peterson for an informed and nuanced opinion about a trans issue would be like going to Neil deGrasse Tyson for advice on how to make a very good and not at all insufferable tweet. Their IQ doesn't make them good, creative, funny, knowledgeable, immune to corporate interests or propaganda, or even give them critical thinking abilities. Our ideas about intelligence and who are considered intellectuals don't exist in a vacuum. Here's a pretty okay video by Wisecrack about the ideas industry, in which they also make fun of Neil deGrasse Tyson's tweets. Low-hanging fruit, I know. IQ is, of course, predictive of success in our current academic institutions, and can be useful for educators to identify students with learning disabilities and get them accommodations. I mean, I have issues with the way our current education system is set up, but as someone who studied education for a while and volunteered in classrooms, I see the utility of these tests for individual educators just trying to work within the system. It's not a defense of these tests or the system, just an acknowledgement of why so many people are so attached to them. Anyway, I don't doubt that some amount of IQ is genetic in nature. The usual statistic cited is that IQ is about 50% genetic. I just don't think we should make such a big deal about it. It's like if I was told a person's ability to play the bagpipe is 50% genetic. Like, cool, okay, that's a interesting and useful skill, but do we really need a whole society of bagpipe players? Should parents be selecting for the best bagpipe players in utero? IQ is a bit less specific than the ability to play the bagpipe, to be fair. But what specifically does it even do for a person? We already know depression, disability, poor self-esteem, socioeconomic class, and any number of other marginalizing factors, including just being kind of hungry, affect IQ score. According to this article, research has shown that children from lower socioeconomic levels adopted into a middle-class family often increase their IQ scores by 15 to 20 points. This study analyzed the prevalence of disability among high and low IQ score groups and found that socioeconomic status explained over one-third of the positive relationship between disability and low IQ. IQ also increases with exposure to education and exposure to test-taking in general, and this is partly an explanation for the Flynn effect. If you don't know, the Flynn effect is a tendency of average IQ to increase over time and at different rates in different populations. That's why IQ tests have to be reweighted every so often in order to maintain a 100-point average. Interestingly, the Flynn effect has, in recent years, been reversing in certain developed nations. According to Wikipedia, that's in Norway, Denmark, Australia, Britain, the Netherlands, Sweden, Finland, and German-speaking countries. That is, their IQ scores have been going down. This is not due to immigration, as was, of course, the first explanation people jumped to, nor is it due to any other sort of genetic reason, as evidenced by this study which observes the effect holding between older and younger siblings. I don't know enough about any of these places to put forth any sort of alternative hypothesis, and I didn't really have the screen time to do research, since it's not really so important to what I'm talking about. I just thought it was interesting, and here you go. I included it. You're welcome. Putting the utility and variability of the measure aside, IQ has proven to be a highly complex trait, genetically. So far, researchers have found over 500 genetic markers which may contribute to IQ score, and genetic tests are currently only able to account for less than 10% of a person's IQ. Genetic tests for IQ are not currently predictive or useful, and anyone that claims they are is probably a grifter. Their CEO has said he was inspired by the movie Gattaca. That's not to say these tests won't ever be predictive, just a warning about the current state of things. If you're trying to have a high IQ baby, your money would be better spent on good food and tutors than on genetic tests. Diversity. Ranting about IQ aside, the show fails to address the crux of the argument against eugenics. The debate was never about whether or not it's ever possible to have the science to direct evolution. I'll just assume we can for the sake of argument. The argument is that we shouldn't limit our gene pool to fit our current environment, which is unsustainable and will inevitably change in ways we can't predict. Economic systems founded on the principles of infinite growth can't survive forever on a finite planet. Unless we also develop the technology to predict the future, 
then eugenics will never be a viable or useful thing to do. You really can't be anti-capitalist or otherwise opposed to our current hierarchies and then turn around and support selective abortion and germline gene editing. In addition to diversity of the genome, should we not also wish to preserve a diversity of experience? At several points, I was reminded of this one Star Trek The Next Generation episode. Yes, I'm going to talk about Star Trek. It's only a matter of time before any leftist brings it up. I've made nine whole videos not talking about it. Okay, let me have this. Anyway, I was reminded of the episode The Outcast, in which Commander Riker falls in love with an alien from a planet where they don't have any gender. But, plot twist, she has a gender. She's a trans woman. And yes, there are issues with the episode, including heteronormativity, and the casting choice of using a cis woman to play what is essentially a trans woman. Here's a video that discusses these problems more in depth. However, what I want to talk about is the ending, which is often seen as problematic, but which I think could be said to be making a larger point about the value of diverse experiences. In the end, spoiler alert, do I have to do spoilers for a show made 30 years ago? The trans woman is reconditioned successfully into being cis, which on this planet means having no gender, I guess. I think you can understand how this is seen as problematic. It's dangerous to imply that gender identity is simply something that can be reprogrammed. But that aside, I'd argue that it's clearly showing the erasure of her experience is negative. I do not need to be helped. I do not need to be cured. We have been taught disability is primitive. We shouldn't want to erase the diverse and beautiful experience of gender, just as we shouldn't want to erase the diverse and beautiful experience of disability. Disabled people have built loving, supportive, strong, and unique communities and identities and even languages and communication styles. Disabled people are constantly figuring out innovative solutions to challenges abled people have never considered. We have different ways of speaking, moving, fucking, eating, loving, and being. Should we want to erase these experiences? Hank Greeley, perhaps not entirely intentionally, even makes the social conformity and bland homogeneity point in a different interview. And then the, the one that, that everybody worries about is enhancement. Is, you know, using changing genes so that parents can get kids who are six foot eight with violet eyes and wonderful volleyball players who have a perfect pitch and always say yes sir and yes ma'am and always are respectful to their parents and all those other good things. Or in some countries are always loyal to the dear leader, you know, whatever it is. In her article, Please Don't Edit Me Out, Rebecca Coakley makes the point that disabled people have made great discoveries and contributed a lot to the world, sometimes in large part because of their disabilities. For example, the blind astrophysicist Wanda diaz Merced, who created a program to hear patterns in the stars that, it turns out, are actually easier to hear than they are to see. If we only see with our eyes, our perception is very narrow. In this vein, Coakley asks, what if that child with osteogenesis imperfecta becomes a world-changing architect because they think differently about how the world is set up due to their disability? What if, and this point holds even if you take a pro-capitalist view of infinite expansion and market value and all that bullshit, what if we lose valuable technology, ideas, and innovations if we edit out disability because disabled people, by necessity of our bodies, have to think about problems in creative and strange ways? So am I saying all genetic diseases are good and we should be sure to keep making babies who will only live for a couple painful weeks or years? Well, no. I personally don't think so. And I'll probably get flack from the disability community for conceding that much. This is, for good reason, seen as a slippery slope to eugenics. And I do generally agree that abled people are not ready for this conversation. But they're doing it anyway, with or without us. They really still haven't figured out what nothing about us without us means. Mostly disability activists don't want to engage with bad faith arguments about hypothetical babies who live in excruciating constant pain, because people aren't just trying to eliminate extreme cases of babies that can't survive outside of the womb. The debate has never been about that. Non-viable fetuses and horrific life-ending infantile diseases are pretty rare, and no one's debating the use of selective abortion or gene therapies for these cases. At least not me, anyway. The problem is that people are aborting babies with 
Down syndrome and dwarfism and other conditions that just require support and accommodation, rather than focusing on making this world more supportive and accessible. The able-bodied people making these decisions are not listening to disability advocates, not even advocates with high support conditions like Alice Wong, who maintain ableism is far the greatest barrier of my life. This decision to abort or use gene therapy is made not by the free and rational individual, but by coercive economic and social forces acting upon them. If you truly are pro-choice, then you'd also be pro the choice to have a child of any ability and start a family without necessarily having a well-paying job. I should hope that we can all agree that the ability to acquire capital and the ability to raise children are two separate and unrelated abilities. Otherwise, care professions would pay significantly more, and being a landlord would pay nothing at all. So why is it that pro-choice necessarily seems to mean anti-starting a family if you can't afford it? Well, the history of pro-choice feminism is wrapped up in a substantial little bundle of eugenics, especially the old-fashioned but not yet out of style race-based flavor. Nearly 150 female inmates underwent tubal litigations in California prisons between 2004 in 2013. This practice has supposedly been outlawed, but as recently as 2017, prisoners could reduce their sentences by submitting to so-called voluntary sterilization in Tennessee. Huh. I wonder what our prison population looks like. Oh, that's right. I'm 100% opposed to needless suffering. That's why I want to improve disabled people's lives right now, and build a world where we celebrate the diversity of the human experience, and empower people to make decisions free from financial constraints. I'm really pretty excited about the possibilities of somatic gene therapies for conditions like cancer or diabetes. I want healthcare to be improved. I want support and pain management and pain alleviation when possible. But we have to recognize what suffering comes from the body, and what suffering comes from the world. And we're currently really really bad at that. That's why so many disability activists are so opposed to a lot of this research. Just recently, my friend asked me, if there was a cure for non-24, would you take it? And I said, yes, of course I would. I'd like to be able to work a regular job and have some chance of not being in poverty and feel like I can be part of a community. But look at my reasons. Do you see intrinsic pain? Do you see suffering? What I really want is a world where my choice whether or not to take this cure isn't coerced by my material conditions. A world where I'm not punished for having a disability. Where I can feel supported and part of a community regardless of my abilities. You see, non-24 is not physically painful or harmful. It's a purely social condition. I have other painful disabilities, like interstitial cystitis, that I wouldn't really think twice about curing, even if we lived in a perfect world. But that would be my choice. I don't know if I can universalize it, and I do know many people find spiritual and personal value in the experience of pain. My main point is I want to live in a world where people can make free decisions about their health care and lifestyles. The choice here isn't cure your disability or not. The choice is cure your disability or remain in poverty. And again, Disability activists hesitate to even have this conversation about what things you'd hypothetically cure by magic, because the much more important fact is that we're here, and we're valuable human beings who deserve care and respect. Throughout history, disabled people have been cared for, and even, in some cases, regarded as holy. We see this in Paleolithic grave sites for skeletons with spinal deformities surrounded by more grave goods than anyone else buried nearby. We see early evidence of surgery. We see, even during famine, disabled people who were cared for and loved. This article states that in the mid-upper Paleolithic, individuals with marked developmental or degenerative abnormalities are relatively common in the burial record, accounting for a third of the sufficiently well-preserved individuals. We've lived in worlds where disabled people were cared for and respected. We've lived in worlds where disabled people didn't have to fight for a place, but were accommodated and even celebrated without question. But we have to fight now, especially as more and more people are exposed to mass disabling events due to poisoned water, microplastics in our food, pollutants in our air, and global pandemics like COVID being spread and mutating rapidly in a world that can never simply pause and hold space for healing. Disability is not profitable. 
healing the earth and our bodies is not profitable. But being profitable doesn't mean these things are not valuable. What can we do? This explained episode does nothing to challenge these ableist norms and ideals that have led to so many preventable deaths from COVID and may one day lead to people like me never even existing. But I know that's asking too much of a 20-minute pop sci show. Like I said earlier, I like the show, I thought it was cool and informative, but it just needs a little more. When critiques of selective abortion and other so-called soft eugenics come down to Isn't that immoral? With no larger discussion of the social pressures people have to abort, it's going to fall flat every single time. To quote Candia Ronk again, The whole punitive apparatus of trying to force people to behave properly would be useless if France did not also maintain contrary institutions that incentivize people to behave badly. If we didn't have these systems in place incentivizing eugenics, then we wouldn't have to tell people to stop doing eugenics nearly so often. Also, these clips are from a critique of the dawn of everything by the channel What is Politics, which I'd recommend to anyone interested in anthropology or political theory. Before you start feeling too depressed and overwhelmed, let me just point you to some disability justice resources. You can offer your support and learn more about various activism movements. Links are in the description, and I've also included a link to a Google Doc with a complete list of all the videos and articles I've mentioned here. SINS Invalid is an invaluable resource for those of you who are just learning about disability justice. It's sexy, it's fun, it's expressive, it's inventive. They focus on intersectional liberation and joy in the face of systemic oppression. It's both a performance project and a resource guide. There is no right or wrong body of a conscious, revolutionary mind. ADAPT is a 40-year-old nationwide disability justice group with local chapters in, I think, 11 states? and plenty of resources and organizing guides for you to start your own. DOJ thought they were going to play chicken. We had a whole shitload of people ready to get arrested again and go all the way. They also accept donations. I've plugged the Black Disability Collective in a previous video, and I'll do it again here. Go support them. If you're not already part of a union, might I recommend the IWW? They waive fees for those of us who can't afford it, and if you ever have an ADA case, they'll do everything they can to help you defend it. There also exist patient unions and nonprofit advocacy programs for those of us who have to deal with the healthcare system frequently and feel disempowered. A good place to start might be researching what groups already exist in your area or looking into the International Alliance of Patient Organizations. Try to support local advocacy groups whenever possible. Speaking of support, oh god, what a segue. I have a Patreon and also a coffee for one-time donations. I'm now receiving SSDI, and I'm... Uh, okay. I still have to live with my family, which is not ideal, but basically I'm saying it's not an emergency to donate to me. I'm fed, I'm housed, I'm clothed, and so are my cats. Thank you to my wonderful patrons who for some reason continue to support me even when I go over six months without making a new video. Thank you for your patience and confidence in me. I've decided to hire editors until I can figure out better management for my migraines and light sensitivity, so... Hopefully that means you can expect more videos in the new year. Thank you so much to Willow and their wife for editing this for me for free. I'm trying to get better at asking for help and communicating in general, and you just, you have no idea how much this helps. Go check out their channel, Questing Refuge, whenever you have a chance. They're as talented as they are kind. Also, sorry to anyone who's been trying to talk to me in the last six months and has gotten short responses. I've had pretty limited screen time and pretty limited time in general. An extra special thank you to Aaron, Anna Estevalos, Eliazar Daniel Ariano Flores, Grubchild, Joseph Dodds Jr., Kate Epithet, Questing Refuge, Sidekick, Turner Bird, and Ooseworm. And thank you to all my other Patreon supporters as well. There's no shame in being a sister.